Good afternoon. I'm Maya McGinnis. I run the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Um, and I'd like to welcome all of you for joining us for the launch of the Campaign to Fix the Debt. So as you can see, I'm joined today by many leaders from both parties, from the business sector, former members of Congress, experts who are all working in a variety of ways to help us move this country towards a serious resolution for the fiscal challenges that face us. Um, and it's really exciting because these groups are coming together to work with the members of Congress and importantly outside of Washington to build a whole campaign to really put this country back on a sustainable, a sustainable fiscal path. So the campaign to fix the debt is going to bring together CEOs, business leaders, former members of Congress, budget experts, economists, but most importantly, voters across the country to really lend their support and create a safe environment for uh, people here in Washington to put together a package that will ultimately put in place a plan to fix the debt, to help strengthen the economy, um, and to do so in a way that really will bring the country back to the strong position it was before, whereas we know that if we fail to act, the consequences will be immensely serious. I just want to talk very briefly about what this campaign is going to do. Uh, we will continue to work with members of Congress to build support in a bipartisan way for a debt deal. We, there will be a launch of a very aggressive social media campaign to bring together people all across the country who really want to focus on this issue in a way that they can become active and have their voices heard. It's building networks across the country of supporters to help get this done. And most importantly, it's partnering with all sorts of different groups, both in Washington, but around the country. There are, um, a lot of our partners are here today. There's one group, youth group, that started that is called the Can Kicks Back. And I just think that there's so much energy that's popping up all around the country of people who want to get involved in this. So we're so lucky today to be joined by the leaders of this campaign. Um, I'm going to turn it over to the co-chairs of the Campaign to Fix the Debt, Governor Ed Rendell and Senator Judd Gregg, who are working with Erskine Bowles, Al Simpson, and all the leaders of this campaign. They will be talking about why this issue is so, is so important and what it is that we can do to really help the country come together and fix the debt. The last point I just want to leave everyone with is um, this is not going to be easy. We know that, that putting together this is definitely going to be difficult. But the narrative so recently has been all about how the economy is broken, the budget is broken, and Washington is broken. Um, and there are times that many of us think that may well be true. But what I have to tell you is there are so many people across the country and members of Congress who want to come together and work on this issue. And one of the things about the country is that Regularly, it is our greatest challenges that inspire our greatest moments. And so the people here and all the people we're working with really believe that as difficult as this will be, this is a campaign that we cannot afford to lose. And that's why they're here joining us today, taking time out of their busy schedules to get involved. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to you, Governor Rendell. Thanks, Maya. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We've just come from the first uh, meeting of the Fix the debt campaign steering committee and it was a good meeting and we set out a few basic principles. Our core principles are there has to be a significant debt reduction plan but it has to include number one cuts from all parts of the budget. And number two it has to be a bipartisan plan. Number three it has to involve multi-trillion dollars of debt reduction in the next 10 years. And number four it must be done so in a way that preserves economic growth and protects the truly needy in this country. As Maya said, this is a unique group. It's an unprecedented bipartisan coalition of former lawmakers, business and civic leaders, and budget experts. And our goal is first and foremost to galvanize public support to produce a significant comprehensive debt reduction plan that can be passed by the Congress and signed by the President no later than July 4th of 2013. We think ideally it should be plan, uh, passed into law sooner. The consequences of inaction are significant. Secondly, we believe that it's necessary for us to create an environment where it becomes not only good policy to vote yes on a debt reduction plan, but good politics as well. And we believe we can do this by going after public opinion and generating public opinion and support in America's hometowns so that people in America's hometowns can deliver that message to people inside the Beltway that we want to act and we want to act now. Now, why do we think we can succeed where other 
very well-intentioned plans have failed, have missed the mark, have not gotten to fruition? Well, for a number of reasons. Number one, because this is an unprecedented coalition. Number two, because we were all dedicated to getting this done. Number three, because the consequences of inaction, we believe, have become clear and much clearer to the American people each time there is a budget fiasco like raising the debt limit. The consequences of doing nothing are becoming abundantly clear. And also because the era of debt denial is clearly over. The conversation now is not, should we fix the debt? The conversation is, how we fix the debt. And the American people, as is often the case, are way ahead of the policymakers. They understand that we need this to get done. Erskine Bowles will tell you about his travels across the country and the tremendous amount of public interest and support for this concept. So can we do it? Yes, we can. It involves just finding the political will to do it. The basic framework, everyone knows, in their hearts and in their minds, what has to be done. It's finding the political will to get it done. We believe that's our job, to infuse Washington with the political will to make sure once and for all we make significant reductions in our debt and remain a great nation. And with that, it's my honor to introduce um, Senator Gregg, who is, uh, uh, in all of his public career, been someone who's reached across the line and found the ability to find real solutions to real problems. Judd? Thank you, Governor, and thank you for outlining rather effectively, very effectively, what our purposes are here. It's great to be joined by so many extraordinary individuals through, across the community of America. These are all doers up here, and they're all here to do something about our debt and get it under control. Uh, Adam Smith, uh, over 200 years ago, who defined markets, got it pretty well. He said, great nations aren't impoverished by their people. They're impoverished by their governments acting badly. And we, unfortunately, have a government that's acted rather badly in the area of its debt. And what we're here to do is to try to help it act well, uh, to give it ideas and resources, which it can be used by the decision makers. We're not the decision makers. We understand that. But which can be used by the decision makers to move us forward in addressing this issue of our fiscal crisis and our fiscal problems. If we don't do this, if we don't get the fiscal situation under control, we all know that we're going to pass on to our kids a nation which is less prosperous, where they have less opportunities, and where the standard of living in this country drops rather dramatically. And we don't have to look much further than across the pond, so to say, to see what's happening when you don't address the issue and address it effectively. And when you look at the, put the American template of fiscal situation over the European situation, the European Union, uh, we're actually in more serious shape in a number of areas than they are. Our deficits are higher. Our accumulation of debt is occurring faster. Uh, we have the resources of our extraordinary nation behind us, uh, which gives us a little more running room, but we better take action uh, on that running room. And what, we've, what we're going to try to do here is support those folks in the Congress who are willing to do that by giving them ideas and initiatives. And one of the really strongest ideas in the marketplace was developed by Erskine Bowles and Alan Simpson, the Simpson Bowles proposal. It is a vehicle that already has credibility. and updated to today, taking into consideration what the Gang of Six has done, taking into consideration what the President and, and the Speaker of the House did, taking into consideration the Super Committee, bringing those ideas into the Simpson-Bowles process and producing a vehicle which will give people uh, on Capitol Hill some resources to use is, I think, uh, a very constructive effort. And so it's great to join with all these extraordinary people in undertaking this. Uh, time is running short. We do have a major decision point coming up with the fiscal cliff occurring and probably the mother of all lame ducks uh, in December. <laughs> and uh, therefore, we want to make sure that people have what they need in order to make the good decisions at that time. Thank you. Well, it's a real... Uh, I'm Bob Zellick, uh, just uh, left the presidency of the World Bank. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here with Governor Rendell um, and uh, Senator Gregg and to build on the work that Senator Simpson and Erskine Bowles did. About uh, a month or two ago, I had a visit from the Foreign Minister of Australia, a very good friend of the United States named Bob Carr. And what he said has stuck with me. The United States, Carr said, is one budget deal away from restoring its global preeminence. But, he cautioned, there are countries in the Asia Pacific that are saying, 
this time the United States isn't up to it, and you better listen to what we have to say. Judd mentioned Adam Smith. Uh, a little 200 years ago, Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury, his job number one was to restore America's credit. And he and the other founding fathers, by doing so, secured a country, created a base so they could finance the Louisiana Purchase, and they made the strongest country in the world. But our generations now risk squandering a legacy of over 200 years. The world economy is stumbling. The European situation is a caution and warning about what can creep up on you pretty fast if you don't act. So the task of trying to get a control of a budget and a debt that is out of control is not only an issue for future generations in maintaining the legacy, but it's a question of whether the United States will continue to lead in the world. I don't believe that a slow growth economy can lead. So the issue that we're facing is one where we hope this group, building on the work that has been done before, can provide a resource, perhaps can help organize some support for the decisions that ultimately the Congress and the President have to make. Thank you. First, um, Maya, thank you for bringing us together. I'm proud to be part of this group, part of the steering committee. I'm delighted to be working with uh, people I've worked with in the past and I have immense respect for. Uh, just a few points. One is we have a fragile economy, as Bob said, uh, not just in the United States, but particularly around the world. Number two, neither party, in my view, even after the election, is going to be able to impose its view on the country or other parties. We've got to have cooperation. Number three, this is not physics. This is not calculus. This is arithmetic. And right now, in my view, I speak only for myself on this point, neither party has a governing strategy. Both parties have a very vigorous political strategy on fiscal matters, but not a governing strategy. Just to underscore one other point the governor made and Judd made, and that is that the, there are people, Maya made this point, on Capitol Hill who already are working together. We've got a lot of smart folks on Capitol Hill. We've got people who understand this problem. But the ones who are trying to work together don't get support from their leadership. They don't get support, in most cases, from the White House. And they don't get support from their parties. So what's happening? I think we've got two wings out there flapping in the American political system and the fuselage is missing. The middle of America is going to have to rally and they're going to have to support people who are willing to work together. To me, the rallying point is right here. Erskine and Allen did a tremendous job their commission. I happened to be driving back from South Georgia when the commission reported Erskine and I had satellite radio on and I, radio on and I heard every commissioner speak that day. And I must say I was impressed. One final point. We've got a cliff that we're going to be dropping off of in January unless something happens. Again, just speaking for myself, why don't we substitute Simpson Bowles for the cliff in early December so that at least if nothing is done, this becomes the default position in June or in April or whenever the deadline is. Thank you, Maya, for your leadership. It's great to be with you. Thank you. Pete Peterson. <coughs> Thank you, Maya. Pete Peterson is my name. You know, it's been about 30 years <clears throat> when I started uh, <clears throat> boring people uh, <laughs> about the long-term unsustainable debt of this country, and today is not going to be an exception, I can assure you. Um, there have been a few moments over the last 30 years when progress was made, like in the 90s, and I'd like to make the case, well, I think there's quite a good opportunity at this time. There is a rapidly growing awareness <laughs> of the problem in several sectors. For example, former public officials who rarely agree about anything. We surveyed a large number of former public officials from eight previous administrations, and we asked them about the debt situation. In the result that I have never seen before in a survey, 100% of those former bipartisan officials said that in, and said they strongly agreed 
that the fiscal situation was unsustainable. What about the think tanks that also rarely agree? Our foundation went to six of them last year <clears throat> and asked, A, what did they think about the sustainability of the situation, and B, what was their plan? All six agreed, even though they covered the whole ideological spectrum, that indeed it was unsustainable and came up with their plans. Third, the business sector. Some of you may recall Tom Friedman said of us in the business sector, these guys are MIAs, they're missing in action. Today, Maya has put together an outstanding group of CEOs. We're joined on the platform by David Cody, the vice chairman of the Business Roundtable, and I think major progress is now being made among the business sector. Finally, let's talk about the public level. level. Uh, recently, we had a survey firm survey 1,000 <clears throat> citizens of this country about this situation. I saw much in that survey to encourage me about the possibilities. They seem to much more fully understand the problem than they used to understand, and I'll give you just a few, I hope not too boring, statistics. 83, 93% of Democrats and nearly 80% of Republicans told us they believe <clears throat> that these long-term debt problems must be solved and must include both tax increases and spending cuts. So while Washington is mired in an uh, ideological and almost theological argument about no revenues and no entitlement cuts and so forth, the public is saying, I want to compromise. We want you to compromise and make a deal. My son had uh, reminded me that it was Nike that said, just do it. And I think we're at the level where we just want to do it. Thank you. I'm Dave Cody, the CEO of Honeywell. And as a member of Simpson Bowles, I was shocked at the size of the problem and the inescapability of the problem as the baby boomer generation retired. And one of the things that really struck me, we were talking about this earlier, was that in 10 years we could find ourselves in a position where our annual interest bill is a trillion dollars a year. And we were talking earlier about, so how do you represent what a trillion dollars is? Because after a million and a billion, it just seems like the next number. But if you had spent a million dollars a day since Jesus Christ was born 2,011 years ago, you still would not have spent a trillion dollars. And that's going to be our annual interest bill if we don't do something. The uncertainty of the resolution of this problem is causing people like me to be extra careful when it comes to making hiring decisions and investment decisions. And if we don't do something, we could very well find ourselves in a position where 2% GDP growth and 8% unemployment is the case for the next five years. We don't want to do that. We don't want to hurt a fragile recovery. That I agree. But at the same time, it's important that we address on, in the long term both a simplified tax system that collects more and a simplified entitlement system, specifically Medicare and Medicaid, that spends less. If we don't do that, we will never resolve this issue. And like a lot of issues out there, both Republicans and Democrats are right. There's a rightness to both of their positions. And what we need them doing is working together to address this as an American problem. And we can't have people continuing to revel in discordant pluralism or just indulging in the joy of simultaneous asphyxiation when we've got a problem of this magnitude that we need to address. Now, to build on Bob Zellick's point, because I thought it was uh, a good one about how the rest of the world views us. As the CEO of Honeywell, I've traveled to about 100 different countries during my 10-year tenure, tenure. So you get to see a lot of people changing, a lot of countries changing, and you see everybody working harder to compete every day. The competitiveness of the world is improving every day. We're not keeping step. And this is one of the biggest things we can do to improve the competitiveness of the country and get us back on the path that we, I think we rightfully belong, and that is that we have to solve the debt first. There's a lot of people in the world, and some countries even, that think that we no longer have the political will to act. 
that as a once great country, we've begun a path to decline because we can no longer do the tough things in life, make the big decisions that we need to. I don't believe that. I know this group doesn't believe that. I can also represent that most U.S. CEOs don't believe that. But we have to exercise the, that political will to actually act and make those tough decisions. Thanks. I'm Alice Rivlin. I'm at the Brookings Institution. And I may have served on more debt commissions uh, than any <laughs> anybody uh, in Washington. We're calling this effort Fix the Debt. But I think what we really mean is fix the economy and restore a vital, high-growth uh, U.S. economy uh, that is capable of leading the world. Fixing the debt and growing the economy are not antithetical. They are necessary uh, to uh, each other. We can't grow the economy uh, without uh, fixing the debt because at the moment we're in an unsustainable situation uh, and we can't fix the debt without growing the economy. So what uh, I was proud to serve with uh, Erskine and Alan Simpson and Dave Cody uh, on Simpson Bowles. I also served with my uh, friend uh, Pete Domenici on a, a, a different task force uh, that uh, we called Domenici Rivlin. Uh, and uh, what I learned from this double experience is, as somebody said earlier, it's the arithmetic that drives the problem. Uh, if you have a bipartisan, reasonable, sensible group looking at what do we do, they come to the same conclusion. We have to reduce the rate of growth of the entitlement programs, especially the health care ones, and we have to reform our tax system so that it raises more revenue in a better way. Those are uh, the key. So it isn't very complicated. It is doable. And uh, this group is set out uh, to convince uh, the American public and our legislators uh, that uh, we're on a track that can't lead to any good, but we have the potential to get off it, uh, to grow the economy, and to fix this problem. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Steve Ratner, and I, I think, I guess, I'm the Wall Street representative here, having spent, well, I hope that's okay still, um, having spent, um, <laughs> having spent uh, most of the last 30 years on, on Wall Street. Uh, let me, so let me say a couple things from that point of view. There's been, I think, at least two I counted, maybe more references to arithmetic. Everybody on Wall Street can do arithmetic, and some can do calculus and physics and all that stuff. And Wall Street is a very diverse place. We have people from every end of the spectrum and many people in the middle. I, I cannot think, I've been trying to think, and I have not been successful, of a single person that I know or work with on Wall Street who does not believe this is a major life-threatening problem for our economy if we don't deal with it. Now, there are many, many different views about what to do about it, probably some different views about how urgent it is, but everybody on Wall Street can do math and everybody on Wall Street understands how big a problem it is. The second thing I want to say about the financial markets is that you can like them or not like them, and certainly the trend is in the latter direction at the moment, but you can't, you can't deny their importance. They are the critical lubricant, a critical lubricant of any well-functioning economy, and we fortunately have historically had the best functioning capital markets in the world, and we want to keep it that way, particularly in terms of how they view our debt. You've heard a couple of mentions made of places where uh, the markets have gone awry. Um, one place where the markets almost went awry, which a number of the people in this room will remember well, was in 1993 when Bill Clinton arrived and was hoping to do some expansionary stuff, and the bond market said, not so fast, we need to deal with deficits. Interest rates started to go up. Bill Clinton was known to use four-letter words to describe bond traders and the markets and so forth. But ultimately, a deficit reduction package was put in place and really ushered in a pretty sustained period of low inflation and growth uh, and indeed even lower budget deficits as, as the 90s wore on. Uh, Europe was mentioned, and we certainly have seen uh, the consequences in Europe of when you get off track. Now, some people say to me, many people say to me, well, interest rates are so low in the U.S. right now, so markets clearly don't care about this, so why should we care about it? So a couple things about that. First, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Um, we uh, have all these problems, but most of the world has worse problems, and we are the flight to safety, incredible as that may seem if you actually study our numbers. But secondly, markets are not 
uh, quite as fast acting and as responsive as you might expect them to be. They, markets are not perfect, and so you can, it, it's a little bit like the parable of the boiling frog. You can go along and feel like you're just fine, and the next thing you know, you're boiled. Um, Greece had interest rates that I think were very close to Germany's until just four or five years ago. Markets sort of thought it was all part of Europe, they didn't quite understand it. And now you see what's happened to Greece. So I don't think we should take any comfort or any reassurance <laughs> from the fact that we have historically very low long-term treasury rates. That could change in an instant. And I think one of the great fears that many people who've been involved in this project have is that that could, uh, that could well happen. Um, the last thing I want to comment about is the, is the fiscal cliff. Um, among the many things the market hates is uncertainty. Maybe almost the most it hates is uncertainty. Uh, we saw some of that during the debt ceiling uh, debacle last summer, which produced the second sharpest drop in consumer confidence in the history of recording consumer confidence, second only to Hurricane Katrina, and, uh, and, not as uh, and a bigger drop than occurred after the invasion of Kuwait, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, 9-11. None of them produced a sharper drop as that. The stock market went down 8%. It's only recently come back to where it is now. So I think we have to be very mindful, uh, not just about the long-term picture, but about how we operate in the short term. Um, I would like to leave this on a positive note and say that I think as the example of uh, President Clinton in the early 90s, as the example of uh, what happened when Paul Volcker came into the Fed in the early 80s and, uh, and cleaned up an even far bigger mess and the sustained period of growth that we had after that, uh, there, is, there is hope and there is a way to fix this problem, but as I'm sure everybody up here agrees, uh, every day that we let it fester, it simply gets more difficult and um, harder to fix. Thanks. I'm Paul Stebbins. I'm the executive chairman of World Fuel Services Corporation. But first and foremost, I'm an entrepreneur. And the company that I started with my partner, Mike Kasbar, back in 1985 and has grown to be 70 offices in 26 countries and is 85 on the Fortune 500, it, it never occurred to me in all the years of building a, a global company. We did all the right things, right? We were proof positive that American ingenuity could compete and be market leaders in the world. But it never occurred to us that there would come a time in my career where the single greatest long-term threat to my ability to compete in the global marketplace was the fiscal solvency of the United States. And that's quite a shocking thing to wake up to. And I think there's a sense that life would just go on, that we would be OK. And as Dave alluded to, as business people, when you, whether it's about deploying your cash, whether it's about training people, creating jobs, whether it's about the issues related to long-term health care costs, whether it's the issues related to tax policy, all these things are derivatives of a root cause. And it all gets back to the debt. And that crisis is real, and it is unsustainable. And we're headed, you know, we're headed towards, as Erskine has said all over this country, to a $7 trillion mess in December. And that level of uncertainty makes it very difficult to run a business. So, but to solve that problem requires political will, has been said by many people here. And we live in a highly polarized and, and oftentimes you know, highly hostile political environment. And I think that we need to stop trivializing the debate. I think we need to talk about this substantively. We, you know, we've got to not confuse advocacy for governance. I think we have to think about getting beyond and transcending the Partnership, uh, partisanship and realizing this is an issue of citizenship. So I'm here not as Paul Stebbins as the you know, executive chairman of a company. I'm here as a citizen of this country, and I think we all are citizens of this country. And this campaign is about galvanizing broad support across all segments of this society to get citizens in all spectrums of this society <clears throat> to help create the political will to get this done and to take control of our economic destiny. And you know, William Jennings Bryan said that you know, destiny is not a matter of chance, it's a matter of choice. Right? It's not something that happens to you, it's something that's achieved. And I think that this is achievable. And if there's anything I've learned from Erskine Bowles, who's, I don't know how many thousands of man hours around this country, is that there is a framework in place. There are people who have been up here who have put a lot of work into building a framework that allows rational, well-meaning people to get together and solve this problem. But it's not easy. You know, we don't get a free pass. Business is part of the problem, too. Everybody's part of this. We all own it. We all own, you know, we've all put in the election, uh, the, office, the people in government who have actually contributed to the problem. So nobody gets a free pass. We all own it. But you can't stand back and watch, right? That would be reckless. We don't, we owe this country better. We owe our citizens better. We owe our children a lot better than that. So to sit back and be passive is like being the accomplice to a crime. You can't do that. So I think that now more than ever, there's an urgency that is unprecedented. And I think that I'm proud to be part of this campaign. I agree with the statement that I travel all over the world like Dave. And I tell you, people were stunned last year when we fooled around with the deficit ceiling. I mean, the debt ceiling. That was something that shocked the world. They thought, boy, if America, the greatest free country in the world, the greatest economic power in the world, cannot 
not get the political will to do this, then we've got a real problem. So I think we have an opportunity to be great. I mean, this was the country, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people. I think we need to take back control of our destiny. I think we can do this. And there's no greater statement we could send to the world than to get a debt deal. And that's what this campaign's about. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Al Simpson. <laughs> You know, we've had William Jennings Bryan quoted. We've had Adam Smith. We had uh, Alexander Hamilton. So I'm going to quote my hero, uh, Al Simpson. I talked to Al a few minutes ago. He just texted me, and he said, how is it there, Erskine? I said, it's so hot you wouldn't believe it. He said, God, it's so cold out here. I saw two lawyers walking down the street with their hands in their own pockets. <laughs> <laughs> Now you know I really talked to him. Uh, Al would be here, but uh, he's had some surgery done on his legs, and he gave me some notes to, to speak from, as he always does. Uh, I just want to make a few short points, because I'm the tenth of ten people you've had a chance to listen to. I am really proud, Maya, to be part of this bipartisan effort to, to put our fiscal house in order. Uh, but more importantly, I'm really delighted to have a chance to work uh, for Judd and Ed. Uh, I've worked with them both uh, many times in the past. They are my kind of leaders. They know how to work. They know how to work hard. They know how to get something done. And that's what we've got to do in the days and weeks ahead. And I think I would be amiss if I also didn't say I'm really proud to be up here on the stage. We have people who have been in the vanguard of this effort, real pioneers, people whose shoulders I certainly stand on, people who supported this effort and actually saw we'd end up where we are today long before I did. People like Pete Peterson and Sam Nunn and Alice Rivlin, and I wish to Dickens Pete Domenici was here because those kinds of people have recognized this problem for a long, long time. Uh, I do believe, and you all have heard me say it before, that our nation does face the most predictable economic crisis in history. It is just math. Uh, fortunately for all of us, it's also the most avoidable economic crisis in history. Uh, the fiscal path we are on is simply not sustainable. And these deficits of over a trillion dollars a year, they are a cancer and a cancer is going to destroy this country from within if we don't get the politicians here in town in both parties to wake up and decide now is the time to act. We, uh, we have to have a, a comprehensive long-term fiscal plan that reduces the deficit by at least four trillion dollars. And $4 trillion is not a number we made up. $4 trillion is not uh, the maximum amount we need to reduce this deficit. It's not even the ideal amount. It's the minimum amount you need to reduce this deficit to stabilize the debt and get it on a downward path as a percent of GDP. Our commission, uh, the commission that Alice and Dave and uh, Al and I served on, uh, our commission came forward and, and Judd, uh, actually this whole commission idea came out of an idea that Judd and Kent Conrad had. If they hadn't held the, uh, the administration's feet to the fire, I don't think we would have ever had this commission. So thank you, Judd, and thanks to Kent Conrad for that. But this commission, this National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform, did come forward with a plan that does exactly what uh, I think this nation needs to do. Uh, but Alan and I have always said that this plan is no more than a starting point. Uh, there are lots of good ideas out, out, of, out there. I have read the plan that uh, Alice and Pete Domenici put together, and it has some better ideas than we put forward. It is terrific. You know, I've looked at the work that was done by the Gang of Six, and there are good ideas there that we can all use. If you look at the work that was done by the super committee, if you look at the work that was done by the president and the speaker, if you look at some of the work done by the, the Biden commission, you can see some really good ideas. And we've got enough really good ideas out there. What we need now is to act. 
we need real action. As everybody said who came before me, we do face a fiscal cliff. If we do nothing and we barrel through this fiscal cliff at the end of the year, you know, we're going to have about $7 trillion hit this country right in the gut. And that is crazy because the effect of that will be somewhere between 1% and 2.5% of GDP, and that is enough to put our country back into a recession. That we cannot have. That's why Al and I have spent, you know, I'd say 90% of our time during the last year traveling around this country. We spent some time here in Washington meeting with members of the House and Senate from both parties, and we got some great ideas. We have visited with the think tanks and gotten some really good ideas there. Think tanks on the right and on the left. Uh, we have designed, uh, and hopefully it will be kicked off today, uh, this effort to put together a social media campaign where we hope that we can get as many as 10 million people to sign a petition to encourage Congress to act and act responsibly now. And lastly, we've been putting our plan in legislative language. It's gone from that 65-page report that Senator Nunn held up to over 600 pages. And while I think that's crazy, and it's probably one of the many reasons I would have been a terrible senator, uh, <laughs> it does, we do hope it will help uh, as a framework for the real decision makers in the House and Senate to come together. We had hoped from this effort we have made and the effort we have made uh, putting together this CEO Fiscal Leadership Council, which has over 100 members of the Fortune 500 now as part of it, we had hoped uh, that common sense would overrule politics and people in this town would be hard at work at this now. But it looks like politics is going to override common sense and nothing is probably going to happen until after the election. What the hope of this group is, is that we can provide the decision makers the kind of vehicle and the kind of support and the kind of, of support from the country at large where they can come together during the lame duck and put together a framework of a policy that will move this country forward. I think if they do, not only will the people of this country rejoice, I have literally met in the last year with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. People from the right, the left, the far right, the far left, the center, Democrats, Republicans, conservative liberals. And if we got an hour with each one of them, at the end of the time that Al and I spent with them, we always got a standing ovation because the people get it. They want real solutions to real problems. They understand the problems are real, the solutions are painful, that there's no easy way out. But I believe those same people will rejoice. And I think Steve is right too, that the markets will rejoice if we come together on a common sense, bipartisan, balanced plan. And I think if we do that, the future of this country is very, very bright. Maya, thank you for letting me be a part of this. Uh, we're going to take a couple quick questions from um, the audience, and then we are going to have a time afterwards for people to stay and talk with all the budget experts as well. So I'm going to turn it over to Governor Rundell and Judd Gregg to manage the questions. Time's up. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. <laughs> Um, just, you guys mentioned this July 4th, 2013 idea as a deadline. Can you give us some idea then of what you expect to happen then in the lame duck? I mean, there's the cliff, but you guys don't sound like you think we're going to hit the cliff full on. I don't think it's our job to tell the Congress, and we're not trying to tell the Congress. We're just going to be here as a resource for the Congress. Now, were I in the Senate, which I'm not, I would suggest that they set up a procedure with very ascertainable standards, which would cause them to either act or for things to occur if they do not act before July 4th, 
uh, on these big issues of entitlement reform and tax reform. Uh, yes, I want to thank Maya for putting this August prudent group together and rational group. <laughs> I also want to uh, thank her for launching this uh, campaign. Uh, I have a question, really basically a question concerning two elephants that were in the room that I see. One is um, the fact that there's no present existing stock of outstanding um, entitlements that we've approached. So when you talk about debt, that doesn't include this huge overhead that <coughs> Alice is referring to. And I want to mention that in bold letters, so that I need, we need to underscore anything about the entitlements as well as tax revenue. The second thing has to do with this, um, uh, the, 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 the combination of the wing knots that people were talking about, about this airplane with no fuselage, and the uh, <coughs> campaign contribution. If you have a billion dollars worth of campaign contributions twisting representatives and the wing nuts twisting them, as I see it, I don't see the logic, the political real logic for putting this together and reaching something rational as you're suggesting. And if I'm missing something on the arithmetic, the billion dollars, let me know. If I'm missing something on the wing nuts, I guess my question is, are we doing anything to mitigate the major contributions to the wing nuts? and voting for the wing nuts on both sides. Thank you. Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> well, so go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, you go. <laughs> wing nuts. This is not an absolute direct answer to your very good question, but several of us as part of this coalition, Concord Coalition, Bob Bixby's here on the front row, Warren Rudman, who's very much part of the Concord Coalition, he and I co-chair that now that Bob Kerry is out running for the Senate in Nebraska. CSIS, which uh, historically is focused on security and, uh, and on foreign policy, but we believe that this is a security issue. The, those two groups and others, including Pete Domenici very prominently and Alice, are going to have a set of hearings in September. We're going to have four hearings, one on fiscal policy, uh, one on entitlement policy, one on taxes and growth, and one on security. Now what will come of that? We don't know. But we're going to get the best witnesses we can find, and we're going to try to get the consciousness raised around the country, and we're going to try to get the middle of America as assertive as those on the wings. I think you should also note that we're not trying to engage in the presidential election at all. What we want is when this election cycle is over, we want to be available as a resource for whoever the next president is to be able to govern well and for the Congress to govern well. And we're going to give them a lot of different ideas so they can accomplish that. Uh, and hopefully the American people who have an inherent common sense, which quite often exceeds what happens here in Washington, uh, understand that need and will be supportive of that effort. All the way in the back. Yeah, that's you. Well, I don't think it's that big a jump. If you listen to what Pete Peterson said in the poll that was taken, 93% and 80% agree that we have to do both, raise revenue and reduce spending and reduce in entitlements or, or slow the growth of entitlements. So I think the, the stage is set. We've just got to galvanize those people to speak up. In, in politics, if you're an elected office holder, you hear from, I don't want to use the word wing nuts, but you hear from some people on the extremes at a higher percentage of their numbers than you do the people in the middle. What our job has got to be is to get those people in the middle to speak up, whether it's through social media, whether it's through traditional letters and emails into their congressmen centers. We basically need them to give the legislators here in Washington our permission slip. It's okay. We'll stand by you. We need, we know this is important. We know it has to be done. Go do it and we'll be there. And I think that's eminently doable. Erskine Bowles' experience tells you that. The poll that Pete Peterson cited tells you that. I, I think this is doable. It's not going to be easy, but I think if you can get Americans to understand how important it is, and people are growing their understanding literally every time there's another bump in the road, I think we can do this. So that's our task. Yes, sir. 
Uh, this morning, during a Chairman Bernanke's testimony to the Senate Finance Committee, Senator Schumer basically asked him, why aren't you acting to fix our economy? Because we can't. It was one of the most unbelievable statements I've ever heard in, in testimony of that type. And it just shows how the Senate is cannot do anything. How do you address that in this process? That type of reality. I, I actually think the Senate's where the uh, constructive action will be energized at a fairly high level. Uh, you have functioning in the Senate right now at least, the gang of six isn't six at all, it's probably 30 to 40 people. Uh, Erskine Bowles and I went up and talked to a group of senators. There were probably 40 people there. Uh, Chuck Schumer was there. Uh, people from both sides of the aisle were there. They were very engaged, they're very interested, and they understand that some very significant action has to occur. Uh, so I, I do think the Senate is quite fertile ground for getting something very substantive done. Uh, and uh, we're going to try to be of help to them. We're going to try to be a resource for them. I can tell you the way we fought through it. It's not exactly 100% of the way that everybody up here would 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 do it. But you you have roughly the right numbers. In 2020, I think the forecasts were for spending to be around 24, 25%, and revenue to be around 19%. Uh, if we wanted to to get the deficit down to at least 1% uh, of GDP, that meant we had to get spending down to around 21%, and we had to get uh, revenue up to around 20%. That's, in fact, what we were able to do in our plan. Uh, I believe you can get spending down to 21%, even with the changes in the demographics, and even with health care growing at a, you know, a rate of, let's say, GDP plus one, if we can slow it down to that kind of level. Uh, somebody asked earlier, how do you do that? You make really tough choices. There's this, uh, this uh, Nobel Prize winning scientist, uh, his name was Ernst Rutherford, and his Nobel Prize project was running out of money. And he turned to his team and said, hey, we're running out of money. Now we got to start thinking. <laughs> That's what America is, we're running out of money. You know, we got to start thinking. You know, we've got to make choices, tough choices. You know, we've got to make the hard political choices. I just ran the University of North Carolina for the last five years. One of the things I really wanted to focus on was making sure that we did our part to improve K through 12. And, you know, we produced most of the teachers. So I wanted to try to figure out how could, how could we produce quality teachers, not just more teachers, but better teachers, more math and science teachers. And so I turned to our team and said, gosh, surely there are some federal programs that we can look at to improve the quality of teacher education. There are. There are 82. Do we need two or three good ones? You bet. We don't need 82. We do $1.5 billion of annual federal scientific research at the university. Is all of that high value-added research? It's not. You know, nor is it at the 3,000 other colleges and universities that do scientific research. I want to invest in education. I want to invest in research. I want to invest in infrastructure. But we've also got to look at how we're spending our money today and make sure we spend it more wisely. That's why we can bring spending way down. And that's why I believe as the economy improves and we go through the measures of broadening the base and simplifying the code and get rid of some of the spending in the tax code, that we can also create additional revenue. Last question. Yes, sir. Senator Craig, I was wondering if you could say a few words about Republicans who continue to draw the bright line on tax codes. Well, first off, I think most Republicans and most Democrats and almost all independents recognize the seriousness of the problem and recognize that you can't resolve this problem uh, in a partisan way because the American people do not accept action on programs that they consider critical to themselves and to the nation, such as entitlement programs like Medicare, Medicaid, or their tax policy, unless they think it's fair. And by definition, fairness requires bipartisanship. So I think most people, if they look at it honestly, recognize there's got to be a bipartisan solution. And I think Republicans look at it this way, or I hope they do anyway, and that's this. If we get a solution like Simpson-Bowles, which 
recognizes that the majority of the effort on debt reduction has to come on the spending side, and on Simpson Bowles it was about 70 percent. Then a revenue side can be accomplished through tax reform, major tax reform along the lines of what President Reagan did with uh, Speaker Ross, with uh, uh, Chairman Rosenkowski, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which gives you a different tax law which is much more oriented towards investment and, and, and economic growth. And so I think there's, there's very fertile ground for Republicans to step into this debate and be extremely constructive, and I think most of the Republicans want to do that. And uh, again, I'll return to this meeting at the Senate. Both sides of the aisle were there in large numbers, very interested, very engaged in how to get this done, and these are really solid folks who really want to be constructive and, and are just looking for different ways to do it. What Judd pointed out to me is there were probably 50 <coughs> members of the Senate there from both sides of the aisle. And, you know, members of the Senate will use almost any reason to kind of get out of a boring meeting. And they had three votes uh, during our session. And they ran out to vote, but boy, they were all back in there. Nobody pulled out. Uh, people are really interested. They know we face this fiscal cliff and they know they've got to deal with it. And we don't d d ignore the fact that this is going to be a formidable challenge. Every aspect of tax reform has some strong special interest and in lobbyists backing it. And that's why it's absolutely necessary to galvanize strong, uniform public opinion from virtually every area in this country. And with that, I think some of us will stick around if anybody wants to talk to us individually. And uh, thank you all for coming.